we just give the Lord some more offering of praise and thanksgiving right now in this place? God is so good. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We want to give you honor and praise tonight in all that we say and all that we do. For you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, there is no God beside you. There is none like you. There is no other Savior, no other Redeemer, Jesus. And we give glory and honor and praise to your name tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord, you are worthy. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. I am uh, just very thankful and uh, humbled with the invitation to be here. Uh, again, I give honor to your pastors, to Pastor Schumacher, Pastor Portman, God bless them both, and very good uh, mentors and friends, and very kind, and I, I am very, I, again, thankful and humbled to be invited into your, into your circle, amen, God is so good, we're the church, amen, amen, we are the body of Christ, and I am thankful to be a part of the body of Christ and that we can go wherever God leads us, wherever God directs us or brings us to, and that we can find his church, his people. And we can worship together, we can praise together, we can laugh, we can cry, we can share testimonies or victories or prayer requests, whatever it might be, because we have a heavenly Father that has brought us together in one family. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I also want to give honor to my pastor, Brother Putnam, uh, for without him ministering in my life and investing in me, uh, surely I would be in a much different place than I am today appreciate my wife and my family and uh, all that God is doing through our church in Monroe. Amen. I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 25, just two verses, 8 and 9, and then I'm going to turn to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11 and verse 17. It's good to hear the testimonies from men's camp and uh, just believing God for great miracles for all these prayer requests. I would ask that you keep, uh, there's a, a family called, their last name is Gillum and the father, Michael Gillum, he was a United Pentecostal Church pastor. He started the church in Monroe back in 1983 and he passed away this past week. So if you could just keep that family in prayer as well. Amen. Exodus 25 and 8, the Lord is speaking to Moses, and this is likely very familiar to us. We've been through Bible studies. Uh, if you haven't, there are many good Bible studies, and I'm sure there's many good Bible study teachers in this assembly. And it's important to know the Old Testament. Amen. It's important to understand how God brings us to where we're at today through those types and shadows and that examples as Hebrews tells us of those who have gone before us and the Lord says and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them he wanted them to make a sanctuary because he wanted to be with them God wants to be with us he wants a place where he can dwell with us. He wants a place where we can worship him together. He wants that connectivity and that relationship to grow. But he says in verse 9, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so 
shall you make it. So when you go through the Old Testament tabernacle that Moses built and you look at the detail uh, of the precious metals and the and the and the different uh, skins that were used and the dimensions and the instruments and the processes, God was very detailed in allowing a way for people to approach him. God is holy. Everybody say he's holy. And we are not worthy to be in his presence. We're unclean. We have sin. Come short of the glory of God. But God wanting that relationship with us so much, he made a way for us to enter into his presence. And in the Old Testament, that was through the tabernacle. In Mark 11 and 17, Jesus teaches them and he's saying, this is after he went through the temple and they were buying and selling sacrifices. He says, my is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So tonight I just want to talk a little bit about the pattern. The pattern. Could we lift up our voice again and could we just ask Jesus to speak to our hearts personally tonight? Jesus, we thank you, God, for your word, for your truth, your love and mercy and grace. I thank you for your blood that has washed us clean through the waters of baptism, for your spirit, God, that has regenerated us to, to new life, God, for the opportunity to come to you, to worship you and praise you and allow you to do something in our lives, Jesus. We thank you, we love you, and we give you all the glory and honor and praise. And everyone said, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I appreciate the worship tonight, the worship team, and the presence of God here. Amen. The pattern. Does anything come to mind when you hear the word a pattern or a pattern? Clothes, quilts, maybe a blueprint, maybe something you're going to fabricate or something you're going to build. When we hear the word pattern, we understand that there is something. In fact, the word in the Old Testament means a model. So there is something that's going to be uh, constructed or something that's going to be put together. And there's already an example or directions, a blueprint, if you will, of how it is supposed to look. It's a, it's something that's given so that we can replicate something else. Amen. Patterns are used as... Many examples of sewing clothes, building structures, uh, welding, fabricating, all types of things. So it's the blueprint that's given on how to mold or construct something. It can be on paper. It could be digital. It could be in your head. You ever just have something that you think you're going to build, but you don't really need to draw it out? Maybe it's, uh, you know, for instance, um, a year ago I built this platform for deer hunting from. I, I like to hunt. My my boys like to hunt, and so we will go out, and I, I wanted to get up off the ground a little bit, and so I built this, but it didn't have any sides, and so it really wasn't, I didn't feel very secure up there. I didn't feel very hid up there, so this year I decided I was going to get some more lumber, and I was going to add sides to it, so me and my son Ethan went out, and he's trying to understand what I want to do, and I'm trying to get it out of my head for him to help me, right, hoping that it will turn out somewhat decent. And so we have patterns, we have ideas and, and things that we want to build or things that we want to construct. I hope that we have a pattern or something in mind for our families on how the culture of our household should be or in our churches, whatever. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. There has to be something to aim for. There has to be something to follow. Amen. If we think that we don't need a pattern or if we think that we can just do things however we want, I think that we would probably do well to get on our face before God and humble ourselves under his mighty hand so that he can lift us up. In Mark 13 and 1, as Jesus went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be one left of a stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this man, this individual, this disciple was impressed by what he saw. And probably rightfully so. 
And a lot of times I think we can get caught up in these types of things. I, uh, one of the first times I got to spend a lot of, uh, of time with your pastor, with Brother Schumacher, was we went to D.C. with a group of ministers. And that was my first time ever being to Washington, D.C. And if you've ever been there, there's many beautiful buildings, many impressive structures. And uh, we can get caught up in those types of things. You have a very beautiful building here. I'm thankful for the building that we worship in back in Monroe. And I think sometimes, and rightfully so, we want to do something wonderful for God. We want a place that's, that's clean, and we want a place that looks nice and that's, and that's impressive, because this is where we're gathering together to worship our Savior and our Creator, and there is nothing wrong with that. Can you say Amen. I think that the people of Jesus' day, and even in the Old Testament, they had that same type of mentality. In Luke 7 and 4, there was an individual, a, a Roman a centurion, he had a servant that he loved very dearly. And the servant was sick, and he was dying. And they came to Jesus, they were looking for Jesus, and they found him. And instantly they said that this man was worthy for whom he should do this. The reason that this Roman centurion was worthy that Jesus should heal his servant was because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. So again, there are impressive things, uh, buildings and, and, and structures across the world where people gather together and worship. I'm thankful that we have that. Hebrews 10 and 25 tells us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So whether it's in our homes, whether it's publicly, uh, it, whether it's in this place, we are to gather together. We are to get into the Word of God because doctrine is important. We are to uh, have the fellowship of the body of Christ partnering together, reaching our families and communities. Amen. We're to have the social aspect of breaking bread together and to praise and worship God together. So God gave Moses the pattern. He gave him the plan for this temporary structure. It was a tent where God could meet with his people. And many years later, Solomon, who was Israel's third king, he built a temple in Jerusalem. And that temple was destroyed and then later rebuilt by Zerubbabel. But even the Jews of Jesus' day focused their worship and their praise and their relationship with God around that temple. This is what Solomon said when he was about to build and dedicate the temple that, that God had allowed him to be a part of. In 1 Kings 8 and 27, he said, But will God indeed dwell upon the earth? Behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I've builded. He was a man of humility. He understood. Now, to my understanding, the purpose that God gave Israel the tabernacle for was so that they could have a way to approach God, like we talked about, and a way for God to have a relationship with his people and them with him. It was a movable structure. It was packed up. It was transported. When the pillar of fire or the cloud moved, they followed, right? They packed that up and they followed. Wherever God settled then, they began to put it back together. Why? So that they could have a place where God was leading them, where they could continue in that relationship with him. But God didn't need a house. The tabernacle, even though the Ark of the Covenant and all of those instruments were in there, and that the mercy seat where God's presence dwelled and, and where the blood was taken on the Day of Atonement, God didn't need that. They needed that. Israel needed that. God does not need a house. Interestingly, Matthew 8 and 20, Jesus said, the foxes have their holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. But we know it was not Solomon, but his father, King David, who first had the idea to build a temple to the Lord. David, the giant killer, right? The one who faced Goliath and said, is there not a cause? The one who took his sling and his stones and he went and, and he sunk them deep into the giant's forehead and then with his own sword took Goliath's head clean off. 
Can I just, can I take a side note here? When we think of that, and we think of giants, I mean, giants played a pretty big part in the Bible. When Israel first came, and, and we know this is much earlier than David, when David faced Goliath and, and, and killed him on that battlefield, we understand that David was anointed king and God was with him, but it was because of his faith that he wasn't afraid to face the giant. But if you back up a little bit in the Word of God, and you see where God delivers Israel out of Egypt, and you see where God begins to bring them out through the Red Sea, and then they, they go across the wilderness. And the wilderness wasn't a fun place to be. They had to rely on God for manna from heaven. They had to rely on God for uh, the, the water coming out of the rock and, the, and the, all of their sustenance, everything that they needed. And when God is leading them to the promised land, we know the story, right? He sends in 12 spies. And ten come back with an evil report. Ten come back. Joshua and Caleb said, we need to go in now. We need to go in now. We need to take this land. God is with us. Who can be against us, right? And so we need to move in. We can conquer it. But the other ten said, it's a land that eats up the inhabitants. It's a land, yes, it's flowing with milk and honey, but there's giants in the land. And so because of their unbelief and their unwillingness to face their giants... They didn't go into the promised land. Can I say everybody has got their giants? Brother Portman just faced a giant. Had a pretty devastating injury. I'm sure that was a giant in your life that you had to face. And sometimes we say, well, that was, you know, that was Brother Portman, and he's a man of God and a man of faith. And, and when we have our giants, we sometimes struggle, and we don't want to go in and face them, and we don't want to trust God, like Israel, and they, they didn't want to go into the promised land. And I'd never noticed this before until one day as I was reading through Deuteronomy, in chapter 2, God told Israel, Moses is recounting this, but God told Israel, when you leave the land of Egypt and you come to the promised land, you're going to go by Mount Seir. Now, Mount Seir belongs to the Edomites. They are descendants of Esau. I don't want you to mess with them. You can buy food from them. You can get passage through their land, but I don't want you to mess with them. And then you're going to come to the Moabites and the Ammonites. They're descendants of Lot. They're all children of Abraham. You are not to have part of their inheritance. I've given that land to them. Now, we know that Israel had trouble with Ammon and Moab. Esau, Mount Mount Seir, uh, the Edomites, they said, no, we're not going to give you anything. Just stay away from us. They didn't have war, but the the Moabites chose to become an, an enemy of Israel, as the Ammonites did. But if you read that detail of those accounts, God said, I've given them that land, and there were Anakins there, and there were these other giants in that land, but I drove them out before them. And Esau, the children of Edom, they drove out their giants. So the Edomites, the Moabites... And the Ammonites, before they got their promise from God, all had giants to face. Everybody's got their giants to face. But for some reason, the children of God who were delivered out of the hands of bondage and out of the place of slavery, when they came to face their giants, they didn't want to face them. Everybody's got their giants to face. Amen. And God is faithful to bring us through those situations. Just as he brought David through. Can you say amen? Amen. So, coming back now to David. In 2 Samuel 7 and 1, David is sitting in his house. The Lord has given him rest on every side from his enemies. David was a man of war. And he went out and he fought battles and he beat all of those enemies around him. And now everything is settling down because there's no more wars to fight and there's no more enemies to conquer. And so as David is sitting there in 2 Samuel 7, and if you have that, you can, you can bring those verses up and, and come along with me. Because it's, it's interesting, it's different when you hear it and see it. Okay? So if you have 2 Samuel 7 and 1, bring it up there. Awesome. 
It says, and it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him a rest round about from all his enemies. Verse 2, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that's in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. And God was with David. And so David is excited about this. David was the one that brought the ark back to Jerusalem. He had a little challenge with that on the, the threshing floor, right? When the oxen stumbled and Uzzah puts his hand forth. And there it stays at the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And then he sees the blessing and David says, we got to get this right. we got to get the presence of God back into Jerusalem, back into the city of David. This is where it belongs. And so he gets... The, the Ark of the Covenant back there, and he puts up the tabernacle, and he's got a tent there. And then he decides that he wants to build the Lord a house. He wants to build a place for God's presence to dwell. He wants to build a place where the Ark of the Covenant can have a permanent resting spot where they can come in and offer sacrifices and wash and, and offer incense and eat the showbread and have all of those things. He wants a place where God can be in his life, and he wants to build where God is going to be in his life. But the Lord has other plans. <laughs> if you move down to verse 5, God speaks to Nathan, and he says, Go, and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, shall thou build a house for me to dwell in? Verse 6, he says, whereas I have not dwelled in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but I have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. Moving down to verse 10, after he begins to sort of allow David to gracefully receive some correction. He says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. God says, I understand your heart, David. I understand that you've done these wonderful things. I understand that you realize that I am with you and I'm blessing you and I'm helping you. And I understand that. But now, David, you have to realize that you are not going to be the one to decide what I get and how I get it and when I get it. I think sometimes when God is moving in our life, whether it's no matter what it might be, whatever we're doing for the Lord because we want to do all things unto Him, I think sometimes we can lose focus and we can just get some really good ideas and think that that's what God wants without asking God what God wants. Amen? He says, and since that time that I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel, verse 11 says, and have caused them to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He's talking of Solomon. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away, verse 15 says, from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. David was a mortal man. Peter said in the second chapter of Acts that his sepulcher, his tomb is with them to that day. Right? David died and went into the grave because when he said, when he prophesied in the Psalms about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and Peter explained that David was dead, this was talking about Jesus. And so... He says in verse 17, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. 
So the Lord tells David, you will not be the one to build my house. I, I get it. I understand, David. You're excited. I've done some wonderful things. You have gone out and fought the battles, and now there's nothing else for you to put your hands to for work. And so you think that you're going to build this house for me. And it's a good motivation. And it's a good desire to want to build something for God. You ever want to build something for God? Amen. You ever say, God, I want you to use me. I, I want to do something in your kingdom. I want to serve in some capacity. I want to do something, God, that's going to have some eternal benefits. But God says, you're not going to build my house. But back up to verse 11 of 2 Samuel 7, if you would. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. You're not going to build my house, David. I'm going to build yours. You're not going to build something for me, David. I don't, I don't need anything from you, David. But let me tell you something. You need something from me. You need, you don't, I don't need you to work in my life, David. I don't need you to give or add anything to me because I'm God and I'm infinite and you can't make God any bigger. But let me tell you what I can do in your life, David. I can build something in your life. I can add something into your life. I can make something of you, David. You're not going to build me a house. I am going to build your house. Do you realize Jesus wants to build your house? Jesus wants, somebody say that to your neighbor, Jesus wants to build your house. What What does that mean, Jesus wants to build my house? Jesus wants to do things in our life spiritually through prayer, through worship, through his word, through relationships in our homes and in our family and his church that build up. He says, I am the chief cornerstone. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He wants to build that in our lives. We can get so distracted with what we think we need to do for Jesus. And we can get so caught up, and and it's all good intentions. I realize that it's all good intentions of events that we want to put on. We just had an event today, our back-to-school bash. A lot of effort went into it. We had decorations and cutouts, of, and and the theme was world changers. And so we had uh, little miniature hot air balloons and clouds hanging all over in the sanctuary. And we had little cameras in the fellowship hall uh, and and passports. And the kids, when they came in, uh, Dallas, uh, one of our Sunday school teachers, did an incredible job. She made these little passports. She took their picture and printed out on these little things that I didn't even know they had. It was about the size of her phone. And so she put their pictures in there. When they went to the carnival games, they, they stamped all the different areas. And they had little stamps from all over the world. And then they got, they got prizes and back to school. There's a lot of effort into this weekend. And it was over in about three hours. And then we tore everything down. Felt like a wedding. All that planning, all that effort, all that decoration and, and, and food and preparation. And when it's over, everything's down and back to normal, right? And we can get so caught up. And and there's nothing wrong with events. And there's nothing wrong with having a, a beautiful place to worship God. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But if we're getting so caught up in what we think we need to do for God that we don't allow Him to do something in our life. Can I tell you, you can't do anything for Him until you allow Him to do something in us. I can't do anything, but He wants to build something in my life, something that's, ne- he said, your kingdom is going to be established forever. Look through the lineage of the kings of Judah. I realize Israel became a separated a separated nation with, with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. I, I understand how it happened. But when you look through the descendants all the way to Jesus, whose kingdom is established forever, right? He came from the lineage of David. That's what he was talking about. He says, I'm going to build something in your life. I'm going to build something. I'm going to build your house. 
And we try to build God's house, and we build our house. David said, I built this wonderful house of cedar. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's impressive. It's beautiful. When you look at Solomon's temple, and when he dedicated it, and everything that he did, it was an incredible, beautiful place. But if Solomon would not have allowed God to build something in his life first, none of that was ever going to matter. None of it would have ever mattered. It doesn't matter how much you build. If God isn't in it, if you're not allowing God to build something in your life, it's, it's, it's a waste. Look what happened to Jeroboam. God told Jeroboam, I will establish your kingdom. You're not even really from any royalty or anything. You're not from the house of David. But I'm going to give you ten of the tribes of Israel. Ten. That's the majority. If you will serve me, if you will love me. But, but Jeroboam, when it came time to worship and offer sacrifices, he didn't want the people he was leading to go back to Jerusalem to Rehoboam. So he set up a place, I believe it was in Dan and Beersheba, he set, up, he set up another place to offer sacrifices. And he was so well known throughout the scriptures, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Time and time again, that's how he's known, instead of Jeroboam, one of the greatest kings Israel ever had. Because he didn't allow God to build his house. Psalms 127 and 1 tells us, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So look at David's response as we go down to verse 25 of 2 Samuel 7. And now, O Lord God. He didn't say, what? What do you mean I'm not going to build the house? I've got all these plans. I'm getting cedar, for, and this, I'm having it shipped over from Lebanon. I'm going to have gold. I'm going to have marble. It's going to be beautiful. I've already got it all planned, God. That wasn't his response. He says, and now, Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever. God, if that's what you, if you want to build, he was so humbled at that point that God said, I want to build something in your life. He says, God, that's what I want. I want that more than anything. I had these big dreams of this wonderful temple and, and all these places to approach you, God, and to worship you. But what I want more than that, God, is for you to build up my house. More than anything else, God, more than anything else, God, I want you to build up my house. Establish it forever and do as thou hast said. Verse 26, and let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and that the house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, verse 27 says, God of Israel, you've revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build thee a house. Therefore hath thy servant found favor or has found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. And you have promised goodness unto your servant. Verse 29, And therefore, now let it please thee to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before thee, O Lord God. You have spoken it. And with thy blessing, let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Whatever pleases you, God. That's what I want in my life. However you change me, God, however you got to change me. Mold me, fashion me according to your will. God, if there's things that need to be pruned and, and clipped off of my life so that I can grow straight and true and produce fruit in my life, God, then I give you permission to do whatever you need to do. God, build me a house. God, I want it to be established forever. I want my children to serve you. I want my grandchildren to serve you. I want their children to serve you. God, I want it to be said that God has blessed my house and my descendants forever. When we follow the lineage of Jesus' earthly parents, we find that it's traced directly back to David. 
of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49 and 10 prophesied and said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter, the, the one ruling, will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The Lord wants to build our house. He wants to build your house. He wants to build my house. Has he called us to teach Bible studies? Absolutely. Has he called us to minister in the house of the Lord? Yes, we are. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, we are to serve God. We are to build things for him. But I can't do anything for him until I first allow him to build something in my life. And he's given us a pattern to follow. Moses had the tabernacle. Solomon had the temple. We've got Jesus himself. The word of God made flesh. If you want to allow Jesus, if you want the Holy Ghost to build your house, then he's given a pattern for you to follow. And say, God, whatever your word says, it's right here. I've heard people say, well, if Jesus revealed himself to me and told me I needed to do that, then I would do it. Can I tell you, Jesus has revealed himself to you, and he's instructing us to do it. Amen. Let's clap our hands to him and thank him for his goodness, for his grace. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I'll close with this. Jesus is the blueprint. His word is the plan. And his spirit makes it possible. As Pastor Portman mentioned earlier, if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's the beginning of the work of God in your life and in my life. Starts with repentance, being baptized in Jesus' name, having our sins washed away. Why? Because he wants to work on a clean slate. God isn't going to build up in your life on top of all the garbage we have already. You can, if, you, if you try to build anything and you don't start with a clean substrate, you can't weld a rusty piece of metal. You can't put a nail or a screw into a rotten piece of wood. And you can't sew together fabric that's fallen apart and decaying. But Jesus makes all things new. And Jesus can restore. And he can bless. So then when we enter into that relationship with him, because he's the door, he begins to build things in our life. And he's got a plan for how he wants to do it. Just stand together with me tonight. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, and I'll just put it in, I'll put it in American. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? You have that from God, and you don't belong to you anymore. Because when we surrender to him, we're saying, God, make me a house. Make me a house. Jesus said, my house is going to be called the house of prayer. Then, God, I want to be a house of prayer. My house is going to be a place of worship. Then, God, I want to be a house of worship. My house is going to be a house of humility and servitude. Then, God, I want to humble myself and I want to serve. My house is going to be one of joy and blessing and thanksgiving. Then, God, I want your joy. I want your mercy. God, I want whatever you want to build in my life so it will produce what you want to produce in my life. Because you're bought with a price, the blood of our Savior. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. 
Jesus said that upon this rock I will build my church. He's the pattern. We're the material. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. The church is the light of the world, a city on a hill. The word hill means a mountain or a rock, which cannot be healed, which cannot be hid. Jesus wants to build our house. He is the word made flesh. He's the pattern that God has given us to follow. And church, when we follow the pattern that's been provided, Jesus will build up our lives and he will build up our house. Two more verses. 1 Peter 2 and 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I know personally we don't know each other that well. I've been here a few times, which I'm very grateful for, but I'll tell you who I do know, is I know your pastor, both of them, and I feel I know them pretty well. So I feel that because I know them, I know you. And I really believe that this is a church that wants God to do something in their life and in their communities and in their families. I know that this is a place where there is a mindset of wanting to do things the very best because God deserves our very best. This is a place that wants to make a wonderful impression on everybody because we know we are to, we're the image of God, right? You can see that from looking around this place. And I'm not just talking about the beautiful wood and the architecture and the lighting and decorations. I'm talking about in the pew. Yeah, you guys, you all built this. You're all part of this, likely. No matter how long you've been here or how new you are, you're part of this structure. And I believe that you want to do something for God. But before you can, you've got to let Him do something in you. You cannot build His kingdom. He will build His kingdom. You're not going to build His church. He will build His church. You are a vessel, I am a vessel for him to use. So before I can do anything for God, I've got to allow Jesus to do something in me. Revelation 21 and 3, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Whatever aspirations or ambitions you may have for Bible studies, small groups, witnessing opportunities, serving in any capacity, I admonish that, I encourage that very, very much as I'm sure your pastors do. But before that can happen, and this isn't just one and done, this is every day, I've got to get before him and say, God, before I do anything for you, I want to make sure that I'm doing it according to the pattern. And if the only way I can do it according to the pattern is if you first do something in me. I just welcome you tonight to say, God, that's what I want. I want to do something great in your kingdom, God. I want to serve you. I want to worship you. I want to praise you. But not according to my will, not according to my plan, not according to my ideology or my understanding of the scriptures, but according to your word and according to your spirit, Jesus, let it be done in my life. God, I want my house to be blessed. 
I want what you're doing in my life to be blessed, God. I want you to build me a house. Amen. Can we just can we just talk to him tonight about that before we leave this place? In Jesus' name.